Let's welcome Pastor Ron. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Are you ready for the new? We all have been believing God for the new in 2022, and we have seen a lot of God's new things coming forth and we have seen an openness on our part for the new thing that God wants you know sometimes when God is moving and it's new we have a tendency to be kind of critical of it and it's kind of like when Denise and I went to Toronto when there was an, a revival taking place there and we saw people like it seemed like they were just undone, you know, jumping and shouting and running and 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 jumping into the air and and people were like really reveling in the presence of God and it was just a, a real strong presence. And Denise and I were kind of, you know, this is different. And sometimes there'd be an outpouring out and people would start laughing hysterically, seemingly. And it, and and at first we thought, you know, that. That's a bit much. Even if we didn't say it, we thought it. Until we begin to realize that what God is doing doesn't really need our approval. As a matter of fact, we can approve all we want and have him not do anything. But he was doing something powerful there and we were aware that he was. And so some things we just had to put on the back burner. Until God started moving on us. We started experience holy laughter. We started experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I think that a lot of times people want to get theological instead of relational and say, God, is, is this you? And as we, we begin to seek the Lord, now, anything that God does isn't going to violate Scripture. But a lot of times what God does, we, we can't give you a chapter and a verse. Someone starts bark, barking like a dog and you say, well, that's not God. Well, roaring like a lion. Well, that's not God. Well, God roars. He's a lion of Judah. And so there's some things that we, we look at. And sometimes the best thing for us to do is say, you know, Lord. And not be quick to come to a judgment because that can quench the Holy Spirit for what he wants to do in our life. I can't speak for what other people are experiencing with God, but I can speak my own experiences have a lot to do with me not being judgmental of other people's experiences. And so I'm open to what God wants to do in my life. And if he made me bark like a dog, it'd probably do me some good. It would be very humiliating. And that might have been what I needed at the time. <laughs> but. We believe that revival isn't just about manifestations for the manifestation in itself. But we believe it's for the purpose of fruitfulness. <clears throat> so it doesn't really matter how high you jump, it's how you walk when you land. And they were seeing people go into the ministry, hundreds of people going into full-time ministry there in Toronto as a result of the outpouring. There were people being healed. That's fruit. So... We're looking into this next year and saying, God, what are you saying for this next year? Fruitful and free in 2023. Yeah. Fruitful and free. And there are some of us, we're fruitful, but we're not really that free. Because if we were that free, we'd be able to enjoy the fruit instead of feeling guilty that we didn't bear more. We're not free from that guilt, that condemnation. The enemy will come and and accuse us no matter what god's doing in our life it wasn't good enough if it was good enough for god it's good enough for me how about you this morning i want to talk to you about becoming god pleasers because i think what god wants to do is going to be built on the bedrock of a desire to please him it's not going to be built upon the bedrock of intellectualism because with that comes a lot of pride you know, intellectual people might like to make the Bible complicated so that only the smart people understand it. The only problem is, is God didn't say the Bible was understood. He said it was discerned. 
And then that means anybody with an anointing in them, anybody like John said to the baby Christians in first John and second John, that they need to rely on the anointing that's within them to reveal the truth to them. Don't rely on intellectual people that want to deceive you right out of believing in the supernatural power and presence of God. If people want to try to talk me out of it, I just got news for you. It's too late. Right now, it's let God be true and every man a liar. I talk about rewards last week, and a lot of times people look at you like you're preaching something new. But Jesus preached this to his disciples. When you pray in secret, you'll be rewarded. When you give benevolently in secret, you'll be rewarded. When you fast in secret, you'll be rewarded. And people are like, oh, I, I like the rewards, but what are they for? I kind of feel selfish wanting the rewards. Well, that's because we don't understand that re the resources that we will need to fulfill our God-given purpose come through the rewards. Jesus was rewarded for his fasting and prayer in the wilderness and he returned rewarded with a greater anointing of power he was led in the spirit in there but he returned in the power of the spirit where did the where did that come it came from him being rewarded for being obedient to god when the devil wanted to steal his destiny I want you to understand when you're attacked by the enemy you're having a desire attack the enemy was after Jesus' desires. That's how he got the first Adam to fall. They looked at the tree and it was good to the eyes and desired to make one more. There was a desire transfer with Adam and Eve. And now the enemy wants to make a desire transfer, transformation with Jesus Christ. The only thing is, is he didn't buy it. He wanted to give him a desire to avoid the cross instead of a desire looking forward, the author and finish of our faith to all that would going to be attained by his death, burial and resurrection on the cross for the joy that was set before him. That's desire. Jesus endured the cross motivated by desire. Absolutely. What did he desire? Look at someone and say, you. Denise and I, at this time of year, we like to look to certain credit cards that when we use them, we get rewards. And of course, we pay our credit cards off at the end of the month. We don't have any balances. We don't carry any balances, but we do accumulate the rewards. And we can use them for gift cards. We can even use some of them for cash. Good stewardship is rewarding. Resources that we need to meet our personal needs come through rewards, just like using that credit card. And rewards connect not only natural needs, but spiritual needs. Look at someone say, they come together. Rewards help us to tap into our spiritual inheritance, which provide for both our spiritual and natural needs. Some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And some people are so earthly, they're no heavenly good. God's rewards address both. Natural earthly needs are kingly needs because kings reign on the earth. While spiritual heavenly needs are priestly needs. And we are kings and priests. How many of you know that? Unto our God. Who rule in both realms or both homes. How many of you know you got a home in heaven? Remember Jesus said, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you. And, and, and it, it, do you have a home on earth? Is Jesus pleased in both homes? Hmm. We are the kings and priests who rule both realms or homes through inherited and rewarded resources. 
God wants to bless you because you're going to need it. God wants to reward your obedience because you're going to need the power to, can, to keep obedient, obeying. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Look at someone and say, we are. The holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who were once a people but not the people of God, who had obtained mercy but now have, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy, were, king, were priests. That's what the Bible says. Now, whether you're functioning in that, in the spirit realm, that, that's a capability that you have. Revelations 5.10 says that he's made un, he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign where? We shall reign where? So the priest reigns in heaven, in the spirit realm, and the king reigns on earth. If God is going to expand his kingdom, there's got to be a restoration of the kingly and priestly attributes of every believer. Rather than looking only for earthly rewards, look for both. Why? Because they're connected. They come together. Abraham was blessed in both houses. Listen to what it says in Genesis 14. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, who was that blessing for? Abraham. Because he goes on to bless God and blessed be the most the God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand and gave him and he gave him a tithe of all. So where was the tithe given in heaven or earth? Earth. Tithes are to supply what you need on earth. Do we store up treasure in heavens? Yes. Giving above our tithes, offerings benevolently. We store up treasure in heaven. So we see that there's a kingly role, which is more here on earth, and a priestly role, which is more in heaven and in the spirit realm. When Melchizedek was saying Abraham's blessing was possessor of heaven and earth, or that God was possessor of heaven and earth, is clarified in verse 20. And he blessed be God most high. Now I'm going to tell you a little secret. The blessing was for both. You see, God needed a representative on earth. And earth needed a representative in heaven. So together, can you say together? Abraham was a possessor of heaven and earth. Heaven as a priest, earth as a king. Where did this blessing come from? Melchizedek, who was he? He was the king of Salem, and the priest of the Most High God. This is the first time in Scripture Most High God is mentioned. So Abraham's blessing involved both houses. God doesn't want your natural house full of riches and your spiritual house barren. And I'm going to tell you something else, Mr. Super Spiritual and Mrs. Super Spiritual. God doesn't want heaven filled with blessings and earth barren because you're not going to be able to do much on earth to expand God's kingdom because God wants the blessing to flow in both houses. Teresa, aren't you glad that you only had treasure in heaven? That came to earth? We need them in both. You cannot help homeless people that have been stuck in generations of poverty. You cannot help them without blessings here on earth. You cannot help hungry people saying, I'm going to pray that God fills your stomach. No, you need to give them food. Together they were possessors of heaven and earth because when you're in covenant with God, what is his is yours. 
And what is yours is his. His home is your home. Your home is his home. Is your home his home? The one on earth is God's home just as much as the one in heaven. Are you a God pleaser in both homes? Or just God's heavenly home? See, it's easy to think that we're a pleaser in God's heavenly home because tangibly we don't really have to show that. But what's going on in our natural home is pretty evident. God pleasers know that. God pleasers know that he needs to be pleased in both homes. God resides in both homes with the priest in heaven and the king on earth. Joshua, the God pleaser, he said something pretty powerful in Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He wasn't just going to be a God pleaser in the promised land. He was going to be a God pleaser in his own house before they even made it to the promised land. It's interesting to see here that when they were getting ready to serve the Lord, they had to make a commitment whether the gods which their father served were going to end at the river of Jordan and the God who is the true God would be the only God after they stepped across that river. But as for me and my house, he was making it clear. My house isn't going to have other gods in it. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And Joshua refers to life before the baptism of Jordan. Because as they crossed the, the, the Jordan, there was an actual baptism just like there was in the Dead Sea. When they crossed the sea and the waters were parted. Here again, we see this. It's another form of baptism. That's why I believe God is speaking to us in the day we're in with these immersions that there is a need for another baptism because we have forgotten what it means to be in baptized into Christ and to leave the other gods behind, leave the other way families run behind and enter into the new way that God wants to run your home. Joshua chapter 3 and verses 12 through 17, we see that they had the soles of the feet of the priest when, that were bearing the ark of the Lord. When they stepped into that water, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. Are you willing to let God cut off the way families were, were run and led? And come into a new way, a new era? Are you willing to let the being approved of God only instead of pleasing God? Are you, are you willing to let that stay on the other side of the river? And the waters that come up from the upstream and they shall stand as a heap, just like it di they did as they were coming out of Egypt. Well, how come they had to do it again? Because they came out of Egypt in Egypt, but now the Egypt's coming out of them. Because obviously Egypt hadn't come out of them because their parents and grandparents didn't make it into the promised land because they brought their fear and their idols from Egypt into the desert and wilderness and weren't willing to overcome the enemy with God's help. So it was when the people set out of their camp to cross over the Jordan, when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bear the Ark come to the Jordan, the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped into the edge of the water, and that's when it happened. And when they stepped out of the water, the water went back to normal. This is Jordan. It's a powerful thing when you stop and think about it. Here it is, John the Baptist, thousands of years later. He's bringing Jesus to the... And all the other disciples to the Jordan. Here we go again. Look at someone. Here we go again. We're going to the Jordan. We're going to the Jordan. Is it any wonder God is bringing us back to the water? So that we can bury the old ways. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and fire so that God can cauterize the wounds of the severance from the old and give us a new power so that we can, like Jesus, return in the power of the Spirit. I want you to notice God pleasers seek to please God in their home. Like Joshua, it's me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. And the God pleasers of, of, of their day, they had a new home that was promised by God. Is it any wonder that the Lord is using the waters of baptism to empower us to be God pleasers, giving us the power to do that? It takes power to be a God pleaser. It takes power to resist temptation. It takes power to obey. It takes power to replace bad desires with good ones. They had to make a commitment along with their family to follow God. God pleasers must please God in both homes on earth and in heaven. Model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hey, God, make it on earth like it is in heaven. God pleasers want him to be pleased to be in their home. When we do that, he'll reward us with power. That's why we're not seeing a lot of power in the, in the modern church today is because God isn't in most homes. Most homes, Egypt's there. Abraham wanted a son to be born into his house and become the inheritor of all that he had. He also wanted his son to continue his natural family line. I want you to see there's a connection between the two, the natural needs and the spiritual needs, the kingly needs and the priestly needs. He also wanted a son that would continue the spiritual family line. Remember God told him, nations are going to come out of you, Abraham. Go out in there and count the stars that's, and, and, and tell them. That's what it means, speak to the stars, count telling. Telling them who that offspring is going to be. God pleasers know that their lives are woven together with God's. They know that their lives weave heaven and earth together. If God's pleased in heaven, he wants to be pleased in earth. And when he is, there's a multiplication blessing that takes place as promised to Abraham. We need not seek our own because our own comes together with what pleases God. When we please God, he pleases us. When we put him first, he puts us first. Reward motivation is faith-based. Jesus walked in two anointings. He walked in the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of power. He was led of the Holy Spirit. Acts 10.38 says, after he came back, he was led of the Spirit. And Acts 10.38 tells us how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Look at someone and say, and with power. Where, where did that come from? He went, with, he went with the Holy Spirit, but he came back in the power of the Spirit. And then everything he did in Acts 10.38, he did by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and power. And the reward of power. Who went about doing good and healing all. I look forward to the services we have that everyone is healed. Why? Because they're biblical. It was after Jesus overcame the temptations in the wilderness that he was rewarded with power. He went into the wilderness filled with the Spirit, and then Luke 4 1, he returned into the power of the Spirit. In Luke 4.14. 4, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. He went into the wilderness filled with the Spirit. He came back in the power of the Spirit. Two different things. Many Christians say they've been filled with the Spirit. But they're not realizing how important it is for you to overcome the temptations of the enemy and grow up because spiritual maturity is measured by the ability to resist the enemy and, and, and obey God during times of temptation. And there's a reward for that. That's why we're not seeing the power we want in the churches because people aren't going after the reward of living right. It's great you're preaching on sin, but you're preaching on the benefits of living right. 
people need to go for it. None of the miracles, signs, wonders, and healings happen until he returned in the power of the Spirit. Jesus said, when we fast and pray in secret, our Heavenly Father will reward us openly. We can see by his life he was rewarded openly. His fame went about to all. We all have wilderness temptations that God wants to reward us for pleasing him rather than our flesh. You want to move in the power of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to have to replace that pornography with time with God. You're going to have to place, replace that addiction with God pleasing. I've never met anybody that had a really bad God addiction. Religious addiction, yeah, but not a God addiction. God rewards fasting and prayer. We see that on the day of Pentecost. After 10 days of fasting, solitude, and corporate prayer, the Holy Spirit, I thought they had the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah, they received the Holy Spirit. Well, what happened on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit brought power on that day. So now they had the Holy Spirit in power. Well, how do you know? Because it came with fire. How many of you think we need the fire back? We need the fire back that eats up everything that moves us away from the power of God in our life. Reward motivation isn't being self-centered. As long as we seek the reward to please God and fulfill our God-given destiny. Remember, they come together. You can't really have all that you need on earth until you're willing to have all that you need for your purpose. Why did God create you? What were you created to do on this planet? The reward comes with everything you're going to need to do what God designed you to do. Kind of makes me think when you're playing video games and after you get past a certain point where you've been winning in the game, then there's these little things that start showing on the screen that when you hot when you hit them with, with with your person that you're using or the figure that you're using all of a sudden you get more ammo all of a sudden you get a what? a power boost and this is what happens when we come upon our heavenly rewards is all of a sudden we get more weapons to defeat the enemy with. All of a sudden we get more power because we're really drained and tired and, and we've really been going through it and the enemy's been coming against us. Whoop! All of a sudden we're like, oh man, I, I, I got on something here now. Yeah, it's called a reward. It's, and if you're having a fit, it's called a benefit. A lot of God's people are operating on a low power level. God pleasers are reward motivating, knowing that the reward will supply them more power and resources for what? For kingdom dominion and expansion. We're kings and priests, remember? A righteous people. If we live as though our home is separate from God's home, who are we going to seek to please? We're going to try to please ourselves. Provide for ourselves, protect ourselves. God pleasers know that they are one with the Father. His home and all his resources are theirs so that they can fulfill their God glorifying purpose for which we were created in Christ because God has a better plan than we do. Now, I want you to understand kings and priests. are both important. You may be a businessman and you think I'm not really that important. You know, I'm just a business. No, you are because you're a king. Now God wants you to develop your priestly so that not only can you have wisdom because kingdoms, kings have wisdom, but priests have revelation. There are just some things that don't get fixed with wisdom because you don't have revelation what needs to be fixed. And you'll see that the Apostle Paul praying for the believers that for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to come to them, the, 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 the anointing of the king and the priest to come to the church so that we can begin to operate in both functions. We're not supposed to just be kings or just be priests. That's why the anointing that God blessed Abraham with was an anointing that came from a king and a priest. And I think that could very well have been Jesus Christ. You say, well, why do you believe that? For a lot of reasons, but I'll give you one in the New Testament. No one comes to the Father but by Him. 
There's a lot of things in Scripture that aren't crystal clear. But if you have spiritual eyes to see, you may see things other people don't. But be open that you could be right or wrong. And I believe God will give us eyes to see. God pleasers are rewarded to motivate them, to supply for them, to empower them. Don't you think, don't you let the devil tell you like he did Adam and Eve to question their desires. Oh, God had not said, God knows when you eat that fruit, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be like God. So the woman saw the fruit. It was good to the eyes and good to make one wise. She desired the fruit. The enemy wants to give you something else to desire, even if it's the meager meeting your own needs instead of doing what God says that comes with both. God pleasers know that they're one with the Father. God's purpose for your creation in Christ is fulfilled whether you're in the church out of the church by rewards and inheritance Proverbs 19 20, 20 listen to the counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days there are many plans in a man's heart nevertheless the Lord's counsel will stand did the devil give you a plan or did God give you a plan? Is it a take care of me plan or is it a take care of thee plan? The take care of thee comes with take care of me. Take care of me may oppose the plan God has for you. God please or seek God's plans. Because it blesses both houses. God pleasers develop God given desires that help them identify and locate available resources. It's like playing a video game. You got to get to a certain point of progress before you see the available resources. And if you don't get committed enough in Christ to see those available resources, you're going to think Christian life is living without those resources and you're going to give up. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, why does God give us desires? I'll tell you why. Because desires play a central role in our actions because it motivates them. By itself, it's not sufficient. Desire has to be combined with belief or faith that the action in question will contribute to the fulfillment of the desire. There's some of us, we don't have any desires because we're afraid to have hope. A person without desire is a hopeless person. Desire gives us hope. Are, do you have a hope that God is going to bless you more than you currently are? Do more than he's currently done. Become more than you currently are. That's hope. Exchanging our desires for God's desires keeps us from becoming vulnerable to temptation. If you don't have a God-empowered desire, the enemy can tempt you with an evil one. Because we are desire-motivated. James 1, 12-15, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. I want you to see the connection here. For when he is approved, he'll receive the crown of life. Can you say crown of life? which the Lord has promised to them who love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted by any evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own. Desires can bless you or they can curse you. They cursed Adam and Eve. Why didn't Adam and Eve have some other desires that they were focused upon instead of being vulnerable to the enemy saying, take a look at that fruit. That, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? When you don't have a desire for more, any desire will do. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And to sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. You know, Jesus talking to the, to the Pharisees and they were accusing him of, 
being of the devil. And he told them that their father was the devil. And that they had the desires of their father. When we come to Christ, we have the desires of the wrong father. And those desires have to be changed. Light thyself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Some of us have immature, the other side of the river desires, and God is calling us to lay those aside and say, God, I got some, I got some wrong desires, but I, I believe that you can, you can replace what I can't erase. James says we're going to get a crown of life. Who gets crowns? Kings. I thought you were kings already. What do you call a king without a crown? I think you said it. Bill, what was it? Prince. See, we come like a king who has a son, but they don't have a crown yet. We get the crown when we endure temptation. How do we do that? By replacing it, that evil desire with a godly desire to please God because we have delighted ourselves in the Lord and we want to please Him. That is, pleasing is a desire. When we want to please God, only then can we please God, but we got to add faith to the want to. And James said, you're going to get rewarded. We get the crown. Spiritual maturity could be measured by how much progress you've made on temptation. Children can't resist temptation. They're going to steal that cookie. They're going to take that shortcut. They're going to try to go their own way. When I was a child, I spoke as a child and I thought as a child, but when I got older, I put away childish things. Have we put away childish things? Have we been honest with God and say, God, I have some childish desires and I want you to replace them with your desires? Because those are the one you reward. Those are the one that lead to the blessing. The other one leads to death. Adam and Eve sinned because... They didn't do anything to replace the bad desire with a good desire. See, the world, they, they desire totally different things than the kingdom. In the kingdom, we look at our life as something created by God in Christ Jesus to fulfill a kingdom purpose, whether we are in the quote-unquote clergy or whether we are in business or whether we are working a job or whether we have a ministry for people coming off the streets. Whatever it is, everybody here has a God-given purpose and plan. And the Bible says man has a plan, but it's the purpose of God that prevails. And if you're you're fighting God because you want your plan. You want the plan of Egypt. God is saying, I want you to lay that aside on the other side of the river. And I want you to make a commitment that you're going to be a God pleaser in your house in earth and in your house in heaven. And that you're wanting God to give you the desire so that he can help it be fulfilled. Because fulfilled desire is a tree of life. Where did the bad fruit come from? Where did the forbidden fruit, it wasn't bad, where did it come from? It came from a tree. All desires come from a tree. The godly ones come from a tree of life. There's some of us, we're not experiencing the joy and the fulfillment in our walk with the Lord because we're cultivating the wrong desires instead of replacing them. And be honest with God. God, I want things I shouldn't. Change my desire. I'd like us just to bow our heads if we could. I believe that the Lord is speaking to us individually, but also as people. And if you're watching live stream, maybe to you there in your home. And he's saying, are you willing to lay down your desires? And let me give you mine. With that will come the power for it to be fulfilled in your life. With that desire will come a crown of life. 
With that desire is the power to resist temptation. With that desire is the power to expand the kingdom. You'd be honest this morning and say, Pastor, I need to lay down some desires that aren't of God. I want God's desire for my life. That's you. Would you raise your hand? Hands going up. I want, uh, if you raise your hand, just come right down the front, would you? I want to pray over you. Temptation is a desire attack. Pharisees had the desires of their father, the devil, and they wanted to kill Jesus in John 8, 44. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Just come on forward if you would, so that other people can get around this. Let's make this an altar this morning, because altars are places of sacrifice. And there are some of us, we have wanted things that aren't really good for us. And we've been doing everything we can other than surrender, trusting that God has what we not only should want to desire, but what will be the best thing to desire. Now just lift your hands up to the Lord, and if you would, would you just pray this prayer with me and we're going to do some spiritual surgery and God is going to take care of some desires that have been besetting us besetting sins or besetting desires pray this with me Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. thank you for sending your son, thank you for sending your son. Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior Jesus, come into my life. Change my heart. I lay down my own selfish and dark desires right now at the altar. Forgive me of my sins and replace my desires with your desires. Help me to discover your desires. And live a life, live a life. As, a as a God pleaser, like you lived with the Father. Like with the Father. I, choose I choose to live a new way, to live a new way. From, this from this day forward. I lay the old ways the old on the other side of the Jordan. The side of the Holy, Spirit, Holy Spirit, I ask for you, ask for you to, empower to empower me to be a God pleaser. I want to live by faith and be reward motivated so that I can do what God created me to do. So I can be who God created me to be. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the Holy Spirit fire that comes. Our desire is the very fire that directs our life. Come, Holy Spirit, give us a desire to please God and not ourself. Show us the destructiveness that comes as we import dark desires, ungodly desires. Lord, we pray for an export. We pray as we lay these down and now pick up your desires, a desire to please you, a desire to be blessed and rewarded for obedience, a desire to, to mature and no longer be given into temptations that, that, that children fall in. Lord, we don't want to be children anymore. Holy Spirit, strengthen us for the battle. Yes. Give us desires that will distract us from the evil ones. Yes. Help us to fulfill those desires. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just take you into another area of prayer. Can we just close our eyes and lift our hands? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. I choose to forgive today, to forgive today. Those, who me. those who taught me 
wrong ways of motivating. I renounce shame and blame and condemnation that I used to motivate myself to please others. And therefore, I use that to please you. Today, I embrace the power of your love that moves me, that motivates me to please your heart. I renounce every spirit of religion that says desire is a bad thing. And I consecrate my desire to align with God's desires. And I renounce my alignment with unhealthy desires. I disinvite you from my life. And I receive today the cleansing power of the love of God that washes me clean and births within me fresh desire. And I embrace that, knowing his love will draw me, will compel me, and move me in the right direction. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, give my hand clap. <laughs> Tell somebody around you something's different now. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, especially if you're watching by live stream, could you let us know so that we can be praying for you? You can fill out one of our Connect cards on our app or by going to the More tab on the app and then clicking Connect Card. And under Comments, let me know you prayed that prayer along with any other prayer requests so that we can be praying with you. Also, by filling out a Connect Card, we can send you the teaching notes for every upcoming Sunday that I don't finish. <laughs> that gives you a little bit supplemental here. Now, as we prepare to receive the offering, we're going to view a short video clip that shows the many different ways that we can give. And then we're going to transition to our monthly missions video update and then to our offering. As we transition to the next part of our service and prepare to receive tithes and offerings, we want you to be aware of a few things. If you're here in the sanctuary and need an offering envelope, raise your hand right now and the ushers will bring one over to you. Here are the other ways that you can give to help fuel the mission here at Christian Life Church. You can give on the app by going to the More tab and then select Give. Or you can give on our website at citlchurches.org slash donation. You can also give by texting Give CLC to 188-364-GIVE, that is 4483. You can also send a check by mail to the address on the screen. Thank you for making a difference with your generous gifts to the Lord. Hello church, my name is Scott Ferrer and I'm the missions director here at Christian Life Church. I would like to spend a few moments to go over this year's mission endeavors for the year 2022. We have supported 14 different organizations from month to month and also from the General Missions Fund. Because of your help, we have raised $33,000 for the missions field, as well as an extra $9,000 for Andre Bronkhorst to help with those expenses from that terrible car accident his family was in. Wow, CLC, that is amazing. Awesome. That brings the total raise to $42,000 this year. So for comparison, in the year 2021, we raised $28,000. So that's a $14,000 increase for this year. Here are all the organizations that we partner with each month this year.
Great job, CLC. And for the month of December, that will be our hashtag when you check into your Facebook or Instagram account. Hashtag great job CLC. So for the month of December, we would like to focus back on the general missions fund. We were able to help out other organizations besides our monthly missions focus. This year, we were able to help out with the Campus Crusade for Christ, the Helper Connection, and the Maine Civic League out of our general missions fund. But that has left us with a $3,500 deficit. So if you feel like you would like to help us with that deficit and make an offering above your normal tithes, you can do so as you normally tithe. You can go to our church website, which is citlchurches.org. You can go to the church app and under the more tab, click give. And if you're in our church sanctuary, you can grab one of those white envelopes and write in general missions fund and we'll make sure the money gets there. Thank you so much, CLC family, for partnering with each and every month without us to make such a powerful impact on the missions field. We could not have done this without you. Blessings to you all. You know, it's been um, something we did before COVID hit was to have like a family meeting and just kind of show on a chart where our finances go here as a church. And when COVID hit, they moved all the date and deadlines for when people had to turn their information in for taxes and things. And our CPA has been behind ever since. So we don't get the information until well into the year. But we want to get back to doing that so that you can be informed on what's going on here. I, I had my taxes ready for them to do in February, and they were backed up and had to pay for my extensions until the fall. <laughs> and were then able to catch up doing it then. Also, pray that they'll get caught up with all the changes and how things are done and taxes and how people what taxes they're charged. They're having a really challenging time keeping up with everything and all the transition. But I think it's a good idea to just kind of let everybody know where we're at and, and what we're, we've been able to do as a congregation. It's been amazing. I love being able to let people know what happened with the missions, but I'd also like to let you know what's going on with our house. And I'll have to talk with our uh, accountant. And I think we, we, it hadn't been that long since we had the information in. The bank likes the information because we have a mortgage like in April. and. It wasn't even done till way after that. So be praying that, that that'll improve. I just want to give you a, a heads up. If there is anywhere we, where we can have some wrong motives and desires, it's in our giving. And it's not, you know, well, I just don't want to give. That's not what I'm talking about. Not many people are just naturally cheerful, generous givers. Sometimes people, you know, I can remember there was a time I felt like I had to slap it out of my hand to get it in the basket. Now it's automatic. I don't have any hand slapping, but at the same time, I really am excited about giving. There had to be a lot of desire for people to give generously from the report that you just heard. Some people have the gift of giving and they really feel invigorated by giving not only them, but by encouraging other people to give. But really, most of us have to be taught about giving because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Apostle Paul said that it was necessary for him to exhort the Corinthians to prepare a generous offering. So obviously, the Apostle Paul didn't believe in putting a box in the back of the building for people to put their money into so that the, 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 the ministers wouldn't be afraid that people were thinking they're after their money. Paul taught them to give for their benefit. Give and it will be given unto you. Paul said it was a matter of generosity, not grudging, not grudging obligation. Don't, don't give out of obligation. Give out of opportunity to please God. Giving should be done with a heart of faith, believing to receive proportionate to what and how we've given. He, he goes on to say, and he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. So as pastors, if our people are reaping sparingly, are we doing them any favor by not saying anything about how it could be different? I don't think so. I think we're more concerned about what people think about us than we do about how they're doing. Grudgeful giving is resentful giving, while cheerful giving is pleasing to God because he loves cheerful givers. That's what it says in this scripture. 
The implication here is that God rewards cheerful, bountiful givers. If God's going to reward, I think it shouldn't be a secret. I think you should know that. He also says that all, uh, all grace abounds toward them to where they always have all sufficiency in all things and abundance for every good work. Is, has that worked for anyone here besides Denise and I? Or are we the only ones that get blessed? God blesses when we give. Amen. Abundance for every good work. There it is. Our God-given purpose and destiny. I'm going to pray for the offering right now. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to give. I thank you for the generosity in the house to bless your work. We love giving to you. We love your kingdom cause. Bless this offering and multiply it back to us so that we can continue to give generously and abound in grace and sufficiency and abundance in every good work. We thank you. You bless us for the good work you created us to do because you said in your word that we were created for good works in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, we have lots of things going on here at Christian Life Church, and you can find those things that are happening where you can get connected under the church app in the events tab, or you can go to the website, citlchurches.org, or you can check the weekly newsletter uh, if we have your email that you should be receiving. And so be sure to check in and, and keep up to date on those events. Amen. Uh, Angel Tree, those donations are due today, so if you have not brought those back and you need to run to Walmart or Target to get your uh, gift cards, please do that and bring it back before the end of second service. Also, I want to remind you about the fast that is currently taking place. It's not too late to join if you haven't done so. Uh, we are calling that the Light the Fire Fast because we are looking to have the kingdom of God advance as we grow in the awareness of His presence. Amen. And so we're holding that 10-day fast because we know that Pastor Todd Smith is coming. Um, he will be here on Thursday and Friday this coming week, uh, December 8th and 9th. The services will be from 7 to 9. And um, he is doing what we talked about today about the waters. His church has been uh, using the immersion to heal, deliver, and restore people in miraculous ways in that North Georgia revival. But praise the Lord, it's not just staying there. He's uh, seeing it happening all over the place. And we We've experienced it right here ourselves. Amen. So come for those two dynamic services and invite your friends. If you have uh, any questions, there is a poster. You can talk to one of the leaders. Uh, it's the posters in the lobby. Amen. And with that said, I would just want to thank you for joining with us today, whether you're on live stream. I've ever needed a mic. People say I have a big mouth usually. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, thank you so much for coming. Let us know if you need any prayer requests or any praise reports that you have. Uh, we love you. We appreciate you being with us. Amen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning into Church Online today. You can catch the playback of this entire broadcast later today on Facebook or YouTube. Or if you want to download the entire message, then on Tuesday, you can get it on our church app found as Christian Life Church Maine in your app store. Our church app also holds so much more information, so take some time to look through the many tabs. I especially want to encourage you to search out the event tab, learn about our upcoming events, and the Get Connected Groups or GC Groups tab to get in a small group. If you have a prayer request, if you want someone to reach out to you, if you need information, then send us an email at info at citlchurches.com. God has been moving in some amazing ways during the service here at CLC. We hope that you would consider joining us again soon in person. 
We've recently purchased Volara air purifiers that kill 99% of airborne SARS-CoV-2 virus because we want you to have your mind at ease while attending service. In closing, I'd like to share a verse as my prayer for you. Psalm 121, 7 through 8. May the Lord keep you from every form of evil or calamity as he continually watches over you and that you will be guarded by God himself. You're coming and going throughout your week. Amen. See you next week.